Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, we will begin today's meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence. We will be led today by Supervisor Crocker. Thank you. you. may be seated. All right. We will start today's meeting uh, with Board of Supervisors matters, item uh, one on the agenda. And I will go immediately to my right, Supervisor Shockley. Sure. Thank you. Um, not a lot to report. Um, last Friday, I did a podcast um, with the Sun Gazette that is now posted regarding uh, COVID-19 and the homeless population and how we are dealing with that. So there's some uh, good information there. Um, tomorrow morning I will have a uh, conference call for my web meeting and that's about it right now. All right. Thank you Just very much. Just trying to stay healthy and make sure people are washing their hands. All right. I hope you're washing yours. I am. Uh, Supervisor Valero. All right. Good morning to Larry County. Uh, first, I'd like to give a shout out to a sailor from Morosi who was featured on Fox 26 News. The sailor from Morosi is now serving on the military sea lift command hospital ship USNS Mercy in San Diego. Hospitalman Lorraine Castimo aboard the Mercy was deployed in support of the nation's cor uh, coronavirus response efforts and will serve as a referral hospital for non-COVID-19 patients currently admitted to shore-based hospitals. Uh, I also want to commend all of our healthcare workers who are giving tirelessly in hope, healing, and health to serve others. We want to thank you for your service to this nation. Um, and then this one will be a little bit extensive, but I just uh, bear with me. Uh, two weeks ago, I introduced a request to consider a moratorium on commercial and residential rental fees for those affected by COVID-19. And yes, I understand that landlords too face challenges of their own. As of March 27th, Governor Newsom made an executive action to establish a statewide moratorium on evictions. This order, however, does not go far enough. It leaves both renter and owner unprotected in the long term. Still, the protections for renters under the governor's order aren't as strong as the protections for California homeowners who get a 90-day respite should they not be able to pay their mortgages. And I get it. We also have to keep in mind that property owners still, under certain circumstances, have to pay for water, repairs, insurance, real estate taxes, among other things. And that can get expensive. So I understand the dilemma on both fronts, and especially coming, again, from a family who has rental property in North Tulare County. At its meeting on April the 6th, 2020, the Judicial Council adopted an emergency court rule that effectively stops evictions. This new court rule will apply until 90 days after the governor lifts the state of emergency related to the COVID-19 pandemic or until it amends or repealed by the Judicial Council. Still, this emergency rule effectively puts evictions and foreclosures on hold, at least through the summer. They do not establish any tenant um, rights or defense to an eviction, address requirements for notifying landlords, or providing documentation when tenants are unable to pay rent due to loss of income and other COVID-19 related reasons, or address how repayment will be handled. Sadly, things are changing by the day, and we are required to move through the currents as the storm presses on. Thankfully, there are mechanisms in place to support communities affected by this pandemic, especially for those out of work and or must abide by the stay-at-home orders put in place, somewhat ironic given the circumstances before us. And that is why it is important to know of the available resources in our communities 
who are willing to fill the silos of this hardship. For those listening and have the ability to share this information to affected individuals, I encourage you to utilize the following agencies who are connecting with communities on a daily basis. These organizations are helping with food security, rental assistance, and other services at this time. For example, Proteus has an expect, uh, has and is expected to receive additional community services block grant monies to support rental assistance along with utility support. Additionally, United Way of Tulare County has emergency food and shelter program countywide and CDBG funds available to support residents in this time of need. Uh, they can visit unitedwaytc.org for help with food, rental, and utility. This organization, too, is awaiting additional funds from the stimulus package that will be distributed countywide. The Latino Community Foundation, based out of the Bay Area, is also contributing funds to support local nonprofits doing community outreach and support. One of those organizations in particular is Changing Minds One at a Time. Another organization that I was in contact with recently is Bitwise Industries out of Fresno. They have reached out to various organizations and people to start the Take Care program. If you or someone you know is elderly, immunocompromised, or unable to shop for themselves, Bitwise Take Care program is offering grocery box deliveries in Fresno, Tulare, and Madera counties. One Take, grocery, uh, one, uh, take Care grocery box consists of nine meals. When available, the box will include one roll of paper towels, two rolls of toilet paper, and hand sanitizer. Um, so again, being able to um, request support by calling 559-460-7809 or going to the Bitwise Industry website. In these unprecedented times, my hope is that everyone will show compassion, understanding, and will continue to work on resolutions in these times. Why? Because kindness is the only strength there is. And that is all I have. Chairman. Thank you. Supervisor Crocker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple things coming up uh, this upcoming week um, that I wanted to highlight. Uh, tomorrow, uh, NACO, National Association of Counties, uh, has uh, their monthly uh, public lands call, which I serve on that committee. Um, so that will be, uh, that's always a phone in, so we were ahead of the curb on this. Uh, and then NACO is also hosting something, and if uh, my colleagues are interested, I'd be happy to share that. Um, they're hosting a, uh, a conference call or webinar on Thursday um, and it's specifically for caring for the aging population during COVID-19 resources for county leaders. And it's in conjunction with the uh, National Association of Area Agencies on Aging. Um, so KTAAA would be our, would be the counterpart. And that's Thursday at uh, noon uh, is when the webinar starts. Um, with that, um, it's Holy Week. And uh, Easter's this Sunday, so I want to wish everyone a, a happy Easter out there and, uh, you know, spending a lot more time. Uh, many of us are being a lot more reflective. I think that it's appropriate to um, just pray for those that are ill with COVID-19, for the families that um, have lost a loved one, uh, for the first responders, our medical personnel that are um, taking care of people and for the protection for them as they continue to tr treat individuals, the businesses who have um, suffered from this shutdown, as well as all the employees who have uh, been laid off. With that, thank you very much. All right, Supervisor Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on Wednesday, we had our local area formation commission meeting or LAFCO meeting right here in these chambers. Um, I took the call-in option, and kudos to the chair for handling that uh, very well. That's difficult to do with everybody on the phone. Uh, we had a short agenda, uh, just a, a little bit of a detach uh, one detachment from the Portable Irrigation District and, and a boundary change on, at Goshen CSD uh, just for a Caltrans pond, so not much happening there. 
um, as you might imagine. And then on uh, Monday, yesterday, had a Tule River Improvement Joint Powers Agreement uh, meeting. Again, took the, uh, the phone in or, or web option uh, on that one, which most everyone did. Um, that one is, has uh, quite a bit going on because it has to do with the success reservoir enlargement uh, uh, program that's happening. Uh, it's in phase one. The, uh, the, uh, the bids are going to come in next month uh, in a groundbreaking would have happened right after that, but because of the the, uh, the virus and keeping apart, the groundbreaking is going to be sometime in August uh, for that, and they're in property negotiations right now. So a lot of interesting things happening um, uh, at, on the Success Reservoir Enlargement Project. Uh, today I'm going to run over to the Joint Information Center and work on a video, um, just a little video segment about what's available for small businesses and for employees uh, as a result of uh, some of the damages that are have happened uh, economically uh, during this time and, and some of the things that are being offered. And so hopefully uh, just be a, a little bit of hope and a little bit of a, a resource um, for the businesses that are suffering. Um, so mostly then the, the, for the last uh, week, taking a whole lot of calls and, and emails and text messages and Facebook messages, um, a lot of people asking about the, uh, the court order about the release of inmates uh, from, from our jails. And uh, so I'll, at the end of this, I'll probably make a request uh, that, that we take some sort of an action, whether it's just a resolution of opposition or make some sort of a statement uh, in support of our sheriff and our district attorney, uh, as they were very opposed to this, uh, this court order. And so uh, uh, it seems to be a very inappropriate uh, thing uh, that, that has come down from the state. And uh, it, it's really bad when you hear about uh, th these are supposed to be nonviolent uh, uh, offenders that are going to be released. But uh, if you look at that list, it includes uh, assault, it includes uh, robbery, uh, it includes terrorist threats. Um, so those don't sound very nonviolent. Uh, to me. So it's a, whether it's well-meaning or not, um, I think it's the wrong thing to do, and hopefully people will agree and will at least have some sort of a, a resolution coming out. If not, I'll just write my own letter <laughs> to the governor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Supervisor Townsend. A um, couple things that I wanted to uh, go over uh, uh, today. Um, uh, tomorrow there will be a Board of Retirement meeting. Uh, at 8.30, I see the chairman of the retirement board is out here. Um, it's good to see him outside of quarantine uh, uh, during these uh, unhealthy times. Um, also, uh, there will be, I think there's an investment committee unless uh, the chairman of the uh, committee canceled that meeting, but that's supposed to be at 11.30 tomorrow as well uh, for the retirement board. Um, First Five will be having its technical advisory committee meeting on uh, Thursday at 9 a.m. That will be a Zoom uh, meeting as well uh, over the phone. And then uh, just to chime in with what uh, Supervisor Townsend made, I, I just really do want to uh, compliment uh, our sheriff and our DA, our, our sheriff specifically for advocating for the safety of our communities and uh, making sure that uh, people understand he is doing everything in his power to make sure that our communities are kept safe during these times. And even with the uh, release of prisoners that's been mandated by the court, that is not something he supported or is doing uh, so freely. He's being very, very careful with this and um, will do whatever is necessary to keep the community safe. And I want to thank our district attorney for his relentless advocacy for uh, victims. I think that's very important that we realize that every person that is uh, in jail has hurt or uh, caused victims in our community uh, to live life a little bit more uh, delicately. And so um, I, I really do uh, commend both of those individuals for the work that they do. And, you know, it's very unfortunate that uh, in order to prevent the spread of this very contagious disease, uh, that we are making our communities less safe and putting individuals out of a jail facility that uh, were put in there for a reason. Um, so I do hope that uh, uh, this is uh, considered and uh, that we uh, as a county do whatever we can to keep the community safe along with our sheriff. Um, also want to uh, uh, spread the message to our constituents, uh, happy Easter. This is a uh, obviously going to be a very different uh, Easter experience, but 
Um, hopefully it's a, a very positive one and a reflection, one of reflection as well, uh, like Supervisor Crocker mentioned. So uh, again, uh, thank you to all of our first responders and to uh, the men and women who are on the front lines in uh, our medical facilities and are on the uh, front lines of the battles being waged there. I sure appreciate all the work that they do and our Tulare County staff is doing an outstanding job during this very difficult time. And I, I think that uh, our CAO and HR, the efforts that were undertaken, as we've seen in the Lindsay District Office, the efforts that were undertaken to divide our staff and uh, make sure that we're able to continue operations should an infection happen. Um, you know, it will take some time to sanitize and get everything all uh, taken care of, but we will be back up and operating and are leaving no constituent unserved uh, during this very difficult time. So uh, kudos to you as well. Um, that's all I have for Board of Supervisors matters, and I will uh, now take up uh, item two on our agenda, which is a request to receive an update from the Health and Human Services Agency on COVID-19 status and response efforts in Tulare County. Mr. Lutz. I'll stand over here today so I'm not broadcasting. Yeah, like Hillary that. appreciates <laughs> it. I, I thought about that last, uh, last week and thought, okay, I'm going to go over here next time. Uh. So, <laughs> yeah, I won't face that way either. Good morning, um, Chair, members of the board, CAO and County Council. Um, Tim Lutz, Health and Human Services Agency Director. And um, I'll start today um, as I have been with our DOC operations and then kind of end on um, some discussion about um, HHSA operations overall. Um, first, I did want to take the opportunity to thank my colleagues across um, other county departments for continuing um, to give us support staff for this incident. Um, the fire department um, has been tremendous. I want to have a special thank you to Chief Norman, who was the first person to send out um, support to us and continues to send out additional support um, when asked. Um, I also want to thank the board um, for generously giving us a a huge amount of Carrie's time. She's been wonderful, um, particularly in getting the JIC organized and keeping our messaging moving. Um, I want to acknowledge the CAO's office, HR&D, IT, General Services Purchasing, RMA, all have sent staff um, to support us on, on various efforts. Um, I had another call out for department heads yesterday and um, in talking to some, I. I think we'll have a few other departments that are going to send us some, some resources. Given the scale and duration of this event, those resources are important because they're allowing us to, to get a little bit of respite for the staff that have been working this for going on a month and, um, and also trying to continue to keep the same level of response that we've had with the community. Um, our goal is to continue to push forward as, as much as we can, but we also um, are keenly aware of um, this, the length of this incident and the impact that it has on, on staff. Currently, um, as of this morning, and again, these numbers have been changing a lot, um, we are at 158 confirmed cases. Um, we also have had six deaths. Um, our monitoring of self-quarantine is around um, 240 individuals. Again, that will fluctuate quite a bit based on um, new cases and also people falling off the 14-day um, watch. Uh, about 31% of those cases are age 65 plus and another 29% are um, 41 to 64 age range. So 60% of our um, of our infected individuals that, um, that have been tested and identified um, are in um, that 41 plus range and a lot of them in that um, more vulnerable 65 plus. Um, and I think it is important to note last week when I was here before the board, we were at 45 cases. Um, that clearly is a substantial increase over, um, over where we were at last week. And I think there are some important points that I want to highlight in those numbers to try and provide a little bit of context and, um, and, and again, hopefully answer questions if, if there are any from the board. Um, unfortunately, 56 of those cases are related specifically at this point to the outbreak at Redwood Springs. Um, and that's something that we have been tracking very closely 
Um, we've been working with the state. We've been working with the local administrator at um, Redwood Springs, but also their corporate office, um, specifically on driving what the plan is, making sure that they have enough staffing, that they're having enough um, PPE, and that they're able to serve those residents. Um, that continues to be our one of our number one focal points just by nature of, um, of the outbreak and the potential. We're one of a number of counties that have similar outbreaks. Um, San Bernardino has another skilled nursing facility in a similar situation, as does San Diego. Um, so it's, it's definitely one of those high priority pieces for us, and it's contributed quite a bit to our number growth um, over the last week. Um, also, many counties across the state um, are reporting significant increases as well. Um, we would expect that based on um, the modeling and projections of approaching the surge capacity that, um, that we expect to be seen toward the end of April to the beginning of, of May. And um, another important note, we do continue to be fairly aggressive in our testing. Um, challenges with this is testing protocols can vary widely across every county. Um, some counties are doing more testing, some counties are doing less testing, and so you don't always have an easy apples to apples comparison in terms of um, in terms of how their surveillance is working. We've tested at our lab 922 um, county residents alone, and that doesn't count all of the commercial lab activity. So we've been really trying to aggressively um, test where there are suspected cases, make sure that we're trying to um, enact self-quarantine and provide the supports that are needed for that community. We also have established a priority testing or a priority system where we're focusing on our vulnerable populations, healthcare workers and first responders first um, in, in the focus of trying to make sure that we can locally keep um, our emergency services operational and, and also identifying those uh, who are most at risk. There is um, also somewhat a discrepancy on the source use for reporting. Um, the State system numbers actually have roughly a day lag on what the actuals are. We haven't been using the state system. We've been using um, our own internal reporting. Um, so typically we're reporting today's numbers. A lot of other counties are reporting yesterday's numbers. So um, where you see us growing faster and then the others trailing and catching up, it's usually because of the, the timing for our reporting. We are looking as the workload increases to maybe having to go to using what the state numbers are, um, recognizing the fact that that does present a, roughly a 24 hour lag on, um, on our actual cases at the time. So it, it is important to note though, we do have community spread in the county. Um, so the social distancing, hygiene, shelter at home requirements are absolutely essential right now as we approach this surge. Um, and, and again, as I noted before, in line with state projections, we feel the surge will probably have its peak in the end of April to early May. Um, so knowing that, we know the worst is still ahead of us. And um, I, I think it's important to also use that, that note and opportunity to highlight um, oncoming Easter weekend. We um, recognize that this is a, a huge time for families to get together to connect. Um, and unfortunately, it also happens to be the absolute worst time for that, given our approach on this surge. Um, with community spread, there are a significant number of people within the community who are infected and either not showing symptoms or showing a couple of symptoms and not enough to, to warrant you know, going into their doctor or getting tested at this point. Um, and it's important to also note many of our cases that we have come in clusters typically tied to events that are happening, um, whether it's a birthday party, whether it's a um, concert or other type of an event that is going on. Our um, JIC team has been working with county parks, reaching out to city partners to try and develop joint messaging that we hope to be able to put out this week. Um, county parks at this point and most city parks are planning to be closed this weekend. 
So moving on to um, general statistics and information by each of our sections. Um, despite that most every county in the state is experiencing um, COVID, we still continue to see a lot of national media outlets reaching out, um, looking for information on, on what's going on. Um, we've had 28 media inquiries, 109 articles that have been sent across, whether it's national to local, um, relating to our response from just 328 to 43, so last week. Um, we're continuing to do our um, daily video updates, um, releasing videos on um, stigma reduction, essential services, homeless population, and um, appreciate each of the board members taking time, I know, to come in um, filming with the JIC to um, try and develop those personal messages that, um, that each of you want to put out. Um, we're in the process of developing an outreach video for the farm worker community that we put out in English and Spanish, um, and we're working with Lali Maheno to um, pull that together. Um, we are putting the goal out there of making sure our materials going out are both English and Spanish. On our liaisons, um, we continue to see growth there just based on the need in the community. Um, that's the spot that we're scaling up the most. Um, we, on the broad objective points, we're working with Quia Delta to support the development of um, a King's Tulare um, COVID coalition. The group first met virtually last Friday and will continue to meet regularly. The goal there is, is help in coordinating what resources are available across the, the hospital and clinic community and have better um, assessment on hospital bed capacity. We are um, also aggressively pushing forward alternative care site plans for the county. This is in anticipation of the surge and would be um, basically our overflow care facilities should our emergency rooms become overwhelmed. And then lastly, an overarching goal is our skilled nursing facility and long-term care plans. Um, we want to really um, standardize some protocols, recognizing um, the huge risk there, recognizing that we're battling that with Redwood Springs, and we want to make sure that we're, um, we're prepared for any additional um, outbreaks that might occur in those types of settings. A couple key notes from our liaisons on our homeless um, liaison, we have been still continuing to, to negotiate terms with hotels. Um, Porterville's been a bit of a challenge. We've run into um, three or four different ones that we thought we had an agreement with. The state even intervened on our behalf, and we still weren't able to, to get an agreement. So we're still working aggressively on, on the Porterville area um, to make sure that we have um, some hotel capacity for homeless individuals um, that need placement. Um, we feel comfortable with Visalia at this point. We also feel comfortable that we have surge capacity into Tulare um, and can manage the, the North County area, but the, the Southeast side is where we're um, trying to focus our efforts the most right now. Those beds in the, in the um, hotels would be for those with COVID, um, but able to isolate without medical care. Um, those without COVID, but are vulnerable, so above 65 or pre-existing health conditions, and those being investigated for exposure, i.e. a contact tracing that we want to have under self-quarantine. So that's what we're targeting those beds for um, as the need arises. We do get a lot of calls to our business liaisons on um, usually a lot of um, identifying of businesses that shouldn't be operating that are non-essential. Um, the biggest ones that we hear, barber shops, beauty salons, nail salons, tattoo parlors, smoke shops, gyms and martial arts studios. Those pretty consistently come up as our, as our tops on, on what people are, are calling in and saying they're still operating. Um, if there's no questions on the liaison piece, I'll move on to operations. Sorry, and I, I know there's a longer report, but it's also a lot of information. Yeah, do you want to take questions as we go through, or do you want to uh, yeah, well, go please. ahead? Um, I think it's, it, it, when I'm on it, I'd be happy to, okay. to stop and, and 
uh, just a question or comment uh, regarding the closing of parks. I know they're going to be closed this weekend, but after this weekend, the playground equipment, arbors and things like that are being roped off or, or taped off so that people can congregate around them. Is that correct? Or My understanding is that does vary somewhat by um, park, by city. Um, I would have to... I don't know if someone from General Services is here to right. to answer specifically after um, this weekend what they were planning to do. I think um, I believe they were actually reaching out to want to talk to Dr. Hot on some recommendations. Um, so I I don't have the final um, final plan at this point for moving beyond next weekend, but I would suspect there to be some changes. Okay, and then also um, have we placed any um, of our homeless citizens? yet at this point um i do not believe we have okay thanks okay uh, supervisor townsend <laughs> yeah tim on the on the portaville uh portion of that was the main street hotel um, contacted that was requesting to be used as uh I believe Main, there were, I think it's been four hotels that we've gone through, and I think Main Street was the most recent. And um, one, we were working on insurance requirements, so that might be the one that um, we're working through now. Okay. I, I know they reached out specifically to the city of Porterville asking to be included in it if they, they wanted to. I'd be happy to um, kind of get a summary of which hotels and get that sent over to you um, so you have, a, have an idea of where all we've been contacting and maybe if you have additional ideas, we'd be happy to, to run those down. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, Supervisor Valero. Yes. So I have uh, three uh, quick questions. You're only allowed one. <laughs> so the first one um, goes back to parks. Um, do we foresee any um, extension to the closures or any of our surrounding cities, if you've heard that they're going to extend the closures past Easter? Um, again, I think it is at this point not entirely clear. I've heard some indication from cities that they might want to be extending that closure. And I think our um, general services is evaluating in terms of county parks what their process is. Okay. Um, I, I think um, Daniel and Brooke can probably provide a, an idea of, of where they think they're at right now. Mm -hmm. um, I can certainly follow up and provide that to you, but I don't have it with me today. Okay. Thank you. And then in terms of commercial testing, and I know this is beyond the liaison meals prior to that, but with commercial testing, I know that when you showed up uh, ye last week, you had mentioned that commercial testing was going to continue moving forward and an increase or an in uh, has that the relationship between county and commercial testing been good in terms of the uh, results and the working relationship? We definitely are getting the results very timely. Um, the commercial ones pose a little extra workload for us because we, we don't have a complete picture of like address information and um, other information that we would have if it was going straight to our lab. Um, so it usually requires a follow-up phone call. We're working to um, work with those lab partners, commercial lab partners, to develop protocols for this is what we really need when you send it over. Mm -hmm. So um, I, in, in the respect of the coordination, I think it is working well. Um, they're really working primarily with our community clinics and hospitals as opposed to directly with us. Okay. Um, but where they do have that interaction, it's been, it's been good. Awesome. And then the third, um, and the, this goes to North County. I know that uh, you've had communication with hotels in other areas, but I know that someone reached out to me just this morning um, that a hotel in Dinuba would be willing to facilitate um, housing as well. And this hotel has actually been approved through FEMA. And so all of the kind of logistics and things on their end uh, are ready to support um, any of, from North County there. And then just to go back really quickly on the parks, the reason why I mentioned this as well is because I just want us to really think about our clear messaging when we say stay at home, uh, and yet we still have our parks open um, per se, yes, close to playgrounds, but again, just trying to make sure that we are covering our bases and that we're able to really send out that clear message that our parks are closed um, because the, 
there are some that will continue to defy the stay at home and will still send family and friends out to the park. And so if we're going to be strong on our messaging, that would be one of them. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. You can continue on until the next question interruption okay. period. No, it's good. It's good questions yeah. and it helps maybe break up my monotonous drone through. Um, so operations team is, is the next section. Um, we are working to bring on additional resources, um, obviously with a, with a three times increase from last week. The public health nursing team is, is really stretched. And what we're trying to do is look at alternative types of positions that can help with some of our um, contact tracing investigations. Um, I, I think we have some options laid out. We're working through to see if we can get commitments. Um, so I'm hoping next week to be able to, to say we have um, some, some firm um, staff in place and we're able to continue the same level of, um, of surveillance. And that's our biggest goal here is um, we, we can either throw more resources at it, recognizing that we're at capacity or curtail some activities. We don't feel that we want to be curtailing the, the surveillance and contact tracing at this point because I think it's been effective. Um, but that does mean we need to find resources to help. So um, with community spread, we are modifying our process somewhat. We'll continue to do our contact tracing, as I noted. Um, we'll begin tracking by household instead of individuals, um, and that logistically um, eases some of the, the burden. We already know that we're, we're monitoring that household. We don't necessarily need to be monitoring every individual in that household. Um, as closely as much as getting a, a summary from um, the household as a whole. Um, we're also modifying the frequency of our, um, of our monitoring checks um, based on risk. And then um, we're also giving extra attention to county employees and um, risk exposure. We're firming up a um, employee liaison within the nurse call center that can help triage. I'm working closely with HRND, um, HHSA, HR, and our health operations folks um, to make sure that we can get information timely and um, hopefully avoid any redundancy and what work HR might be needing to do versus health operations. Um, logistics, I know that's always a, a big piece. So um, we have delivered from last week um, 54,794 pieces of PPE. Um, I know PPE continues to be a big question, and I wish I had better news on the PPE front, um, but we do continue to see severe shortages um, in our PPE. Our um, allocations from the state have dwindled, and what's been widely rep reported as um, shortages in the national stockpile are also impacting us locally, where, um, and even yesterday I reported out to department heads that we look like we were getting 10% of what we requested from our most recent PPE order. It was actually closer to 5% by the time we inventoried and tracked it. So that um, presents a, a huge challenge for us in terms of PPE for our local responders. And, and Tim, real quick, before you leave that, um, I, I just wanted to uh, reiterate some of the messages that I've been receiving from constituents who are uh, in-home supportive services providers uh, uh, having to go along and continue providing the care they provide to their, their clients, um, but many of them absent uh, PPE, which they have actually tried to go out and purchase themselves, um, just even privately, and are unable to do so because there's, there's nothing available. So um, if there's anything we can do to, to make sure that we have uh, uh, our providers in the in-home supportive services program uh, having access to PPE when available, that would be great. And the, the challenge being, because that was our, our hope, um, the challenge being, and this is per CDC guidance and CDPH guidance, is prioritization yeah. of PPE is going yeah. to the hospitals first, um, recognizing that we have a lot of, of gaps and what we're trying to do internally, and I'll talk about that a bit for Health and Human Services, is really even curtail further any face-to-face -face interactions that our, our staff are having, recognizing that we just don't have um, the PPE necessary to, um, to support some of those operations. 
Um, on the logistics side too, we continue to test people. Um, however, the reagents also are now becoming um, much harder to, to source. When we started, we had a really good supply of those reagents. Um, we've been aggressively shopping for those reagents. We've even modified some of our process to use different reagents um, to, to do the tests. But there is a risk by end of the month that we will be out of reagent at our local lab to be able to continue testing if we can't um, get resupplied. So that's another um, key area that we're really focusing on. Um, I know last week there were some questions about some of the new tests coming out. Um, the Abbott machine was mentioned, which Quia Delta does have um, a couple Abbott machines. Um, the problem is um, everybody, the, the machines themselves are, are great if people have them, but they haven't been able to get the, all the cartridges and reagents to be able to do the testing for them. So while we don't have the, the ability to do a five minute test, um, some do, but unfortunately they also don't have the supplies to be able to do those tests. And I think Quia Delta reported that even to, um, to test the machine to get it um, to get it to be yes certified, we are comfortable with the results. It's, it's giving us the correct numbers. They had to use about 400 of the 500 um, tests that they had just to get it calibrated. So, um, you know, every little thing like that ends up eating up a lot of the, the precious um, testing resources. And then on costs, we are at 670,272 um, to date. 226 employees are specifically assigned through the DOC to support the ongoing operations. 226. So um, for broader HHSA operations, um, in light of the severe PPE shortage, um, we are working to further curtail any of our face-to-face -face interactions, um, and we're prioritizing the PPE to mandated functions that we just cannot avoid a face-to-face -face on. Typically, those are in the child welfare services realm on our, on our follow-ups. Um, so we wanna make sure we're, we're protecting our most vulnerable in the community, but also recognize that um, we need to have processes in place that can avoid face-to-face um, -face interactions with the public at this point. There, um, as, as noted, um, there was an incident last um, Friday where two staff at Lindsay District Office did um, test positive. We followed what is our, our continuity of operation protocol, sent all staff home as soon as, um, as soon as those test results came in. We're bringing in a vendor to deep clean and sanitize that office and keeping it closed for the remainder of this week. Um, next week, we have our other 50% of the reserve staff who are scheduled to be in for their normal rotation. Um, they have now been home for 14 days, so if any are sick, they would stay home. Um, but that way we ensure that we at least have um, a healthy workforce that um, is lower risk for exposure um, coming back in and, and keeping operations going. We'll continue to um, to use that strategy um, unless, unless things change dramatically and then we'll reassess, but thus far it's been working. And then specific program activity. Um, I appreciate the um, comments on um, the early or the mandated releases from the state. Our behavioral health services has also been working with the probation department um, and the, um, our justice partners specifically to, to look at some of those releases. And looking at it, um, and I had the number roughly, um, I think about 52% of those that are being released have some history with our behavioral health services. And so we're working then with WellPath to um, make sure we have a, um, a handoff on care management, connecting them with the case manager, and um, making sure they don't fall between the cracks on, on our side for behavioral health. The calls to our access line um, this last week were about 150 a day. That's down from the 200 a day the prior week, but well above our norm of about 33, 35 per day. 
So then lastly, human services, um, that's where we've had a lot of activity recently as well. Um, we have implemented a human services operations center that is set up in a similar structure to our DOC. The goal there is um, organize the community response, make sure we're bringing all of our um, community nonprofits to the table, helping to make sure we're not duplicating effort and um, working together. The, obviously with um, the high need, scarce resources, we're working hard to make sure that we're serving as many people as possible and not, um, not duplicating efforts anywhere. And then I have provided the board um, the information on our eligibility um, office visits. As you can see the, um, from the dashboard sheets that I gave you, we continue to see um, an increase. I think our volume from um, last week was up another 20% um, on that previous week. I think the um, looking at these, and this is a first shot at at um, metrics, I think I want to fine tune some of these, but moreover, um, I'm trying to, to do better on, um, we're developing a public facing dashboard that's going to provide everybody this information um, on a weekly basis. It'll be updated to um, give the community a snapshot of applications and general need that's out there. Um, we met with staff last week to, to kind of map out what that dashboard will look like. My hope is it'll be live by the end of this week. And that concludes my report. If anyone has questions, I'd be happy to answer. I have a comment from, or a question from the CAO, CAO. Oh, that's what it was. It Terry just said <laughs> CAO. It's okay. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. <laughs> You're the board. I just, I just wanted to um, quickly um, provide an update on the parks because. Um, if GSA sent me a note here. So um, we also discussed this in length with the city managers last week. So I think most um, cities and the county are sort of jointly uh, going um, together on this for essentially closing the county, the parks for Easter weekend as much as you can close a park. Because in many cases, there's no barrier to actually keep people out. Um, our but our county parks after Easter, um, unless something changes, will continue to operate as normal with just the play structures being roped off um, and still the restrooms being opened. And of course, that's subject to change as, as things go along. Um, but there, there, is, um, there has been a lot of discussion and recognition that it's just very difficult to close a park. Um, people are going to walk in. There's really not a lot of barriers to keep people out. Um, but I do know the cities are going to make a concerted effort this week, at least in Visalia and probably in Tulare, and uh, I'm not sure about Porterville, to keep the number of people gathering at the parks um, to a minimum. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to follow up on that. Okay. Supervisor Shuckley. I want to add to that. Um, I think the, the playground structures are good. I think maybe the arbors um, may need to be roped off also, so it you know lessens the incentive for folks to want to gather around there and maybe think you know, 10 or 12 or 15 people are okay to sit around those picnic benches. <clears throat> I've had a lot, of course, a lot of phone calls and and emails regarding um, Rocky Hill. Also, I don't know you know what we can do about that. I know Supervisor Crocker last week mentioned it and asked folks, but you know just. Sunday, I drove, you know, around there, and there were cars lined up and people walking, and I see, you know, so I don't know if anything we can do about that. Um, and then this weekend, Tim, and I'm getting some calls, and I'm seeing it myself, <clears throat> are the vendors out on the corners uh, selling the corn and the strawberries and the cut fruit that, you know, they're not permitted. Um, you know, I don't know what we can do about that. But if you need my help, I'm always there to help. Let me um, go back and talk to our environmental folks. We know that's, Saturday that's and usually Sunday a challenge. Is, yeah. um, given that we have staff that are rotated out, it might be an opportunity to see, can we bring them in since they're um, off during the week? Do a sweep or, or something like that yeah. and let them know that we are watching. Usually if we do those sweeps, we try and coordinate with um, local PD, in this case Visalia. Um, and the question is, we'll have to work out, 
can we do that in a socially distanced way? Um, because typically that means on a lot of those, we have to end up taking possession of all of the, the goods and products. Um, but that's, that's a really good point. I know I've seen them too on the weekends. Um, and it's, it, it's a problem normally, but I think now even with, more so now with, with even more sanitary so things and all that. Yeah. So Thank you. I will um, bring that back and, and try and develop a plan. Thanks. Okay, Supervisor Townsend. Yeah, uh, Tim, on the Portable Developmental Center, have you heard anything else uh, after the governor's announcement that they were, in fact, uh, looking more closely at Portable Developmental Center and up to 246 potential surge beds? No, unfortunately, and we've continued to push on that piece because the last we heard was 50, and then the governor came out with the 252, I think, that he put out in yesterday's um, briefing, which, again, took us by surprise because that's usually the first time we're hearing about it, too, and our experience has been even within um, PDC. Staff haven't necessarily been told or no, um, and it sounds like the original plan of 50 has changed enough that um, that staff are really confused. So we are really trying to push on what does that look like. Our alternative care site group, um, that's one of the key areas that they've been tasked with is get a, get a plan laid out, written, and um, then we can submit it up so people can see what that's gonna look like. Okay, thank you. And let me know if I can help at all. Definitely. The liaison at all with the hospital in the area. The hospital has been great. The city's been great. The, the sad thing is we're just not getting information on the state side, and that's where we're, we're pushing. Okay, that's what I sus suspected, but thank you for yeah. clarifying. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Crocker? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just uh, to note, uh, that uh, the Bureau of Land Management, they've shut down and closed some of their trails, um, specifically, I think, on Sand Creek up in the Three Rivers area. Um, I know Forest Service has already uh, taken steps for their public areas, although I think they're fairly limited as far as what's available, unless you want to snowshoe into certain <laughs> sites. And I guess we don't need to worry about Baltz Park either, unless you want to snowshoe in. Um, and then Sequoia Riverlands Trust has also uh, recently, within the last uh, few days, have shut down their preserves um, from uh, the public. So um, just food for thought. Um, and then I, I wanted to really just thank um, you, Tim, and your staff for um, creating the map last week um, that shows where the um, where people, you know, in, in regional areas where, where people that have the infections are and sharing that with the public, I think that's an extremely helpful tool. Um, I've heard a lot of very positive things about that. Obviously, you know, we're not gonna please everyone, but I think that is, um, that's a good faith effort in trying to be transparent and sharing more information while still protecting the individuals that do have it or, um, you know, from, any type of mass hysteria or something. So thank you for that. Of course. Any additional questions for Tim? Your comment? Sure, go ahead, Supervisor. Uh, I just uh, wanted to reiterate, um, I know Supervisor, uh, Vice Chair Chucklian mentioned this about inspections as well as something that I brought up last week. Um, so again, continue to work on something where we can be proactive on that. Um, and then two, again, just thanking you and your agency for spearheading the work that needs to get done on the front lines and, and being able to um, inform the public in a timely manner. I believe that we have just an amazing PR uh, team out there doing the work, sharing the information. And so again, thank you um, for all the work and your leadership in this endeavor. I know it's uncharted territory, but you're doing the work that needs to get done. Thank you. Anything further from my colleagues? Thank you, Tim. Appreciate the update. I think it's a, a great uh, and consistent setting for you to be able to tell uh, the story of the HHSA and how the county is uh, handling the COVID-19 situation from a, an at-large and general perspective. So uh, I think that's a really uh, great thing and is much appreciated amongst the, 
uh, public here in the county. So thank you, Tim, and uh, thank you to your staff for all the hard work you're doing right now. Well, I want to want to thank the board for your continued support. Um, obviously, this has been an unprecedented time. Um, it would our PIO team has been great. It would be hard pressed for me to find any one of our teams that haven't done just an amazing job. Um, really stepped up, working the long hours, um, being flexible, and just making it work. Um, it really has been a, a agency-wide effort, and I'm so proud to be uh, over this this group of employees. They're doing a wonderful job. Thank you, Tim. Okay, uh, we are now going to move on and take item three on uh, the calendar. This is uh, time for public comments. Public comments uh, can be uh, given to the board on any item uh, that is under our jurisdiction but is not on today's agenda. Public comment can and will be limited to three minutes. I know that we have received uh, numerous emails uh, with public comments. Those have been entered into the record. Uh, at this time, and we have several callers online to uh, bring forward public comment. Uh, we'll take members in the audience uh, first right now, uh, and then we will go to our phone lines. Uh, are there members of the audience who are here wishing to speak under public comment? If so, please do come forward, state your name and address, and public comment will be limited to three minutes. Anyone wishing to speak under the public comment period? Okay. Uh, we will now uh, turn to our callers at this time. Madam Clerk? She'll send the first call right now. What's that? She's sending the first call through right now. Okay. Good morning. Thank you for holding. You are now connected to the board meeting. Please state your name and address for the record. Your three minutes will begin now. My name is Carol Greening, and I live right here in Visalia. There are two actions, both related to the COVID-19 crisis, that you must take now. This emergency demands smart, immediate action to save lives. First, our fellow Tulare County residents are facing impossible choices. Their funds are limited. They cannot work during this shutdown. Do they buy food or do they attempt to pay rent? I urge you to immediately pass a rent and eviction moratorium. It is necessary and humane. People are safer at home. You can help them stay in their homes by preventing eviction. Failure to prevent eviction threatens to increase our homeless population. Declaring a rent and eviction moratorium is one step toward helping prevent the spread of this lethal virus. You can protect the health and safety of Tulare County residents. You have the power because we are in an unprecedented emergency and you are compelled to act on humanitarian grounds. Second, direct the sheriff to it decrease the jail population. It is impossible to practice social distancing in jail. It is extremely difficult to maintain personal hygiene, such as frequent hand washing and disinfection of surfaces. Decreasing the jail population protects the jailers as well as the jailed. Release the most vulnerable um, population. The CDC says elderly people or those who have asthma, cancer, heart disease, lung disease, and diabetes are most vulnerable. Pregnant women and people with compromised immune systems are also at risk. Then release individuals who have 30 days or less remaining in their sentence. Pre-trial detainees should also be release released. Our state constitution allows individuals to be released on their own recognizance, except in the case of public safety. Pre-trial detainees have not been sentenced, and they, a case against them has not been proved, and they should be allowed back to their home to shelter in place. With a heart full of compassion for all of us, as we navigate the troubled times of COVID-19, I urge you to treat our fellow human beings with justice and compassion. 
Remember, pass a moratorium on rent and evictions and lower the jail population to prevent COVID-19 spread. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next public comment. Good morning. Thank you for holding. You are now connected to the board meeting. Please state your name and address for the record. Your three minutes will begin now. Good morning, supervisors. Uh, this is uh, Pedro Hernandez um, with California Audubon. Um, my address is 1318 North Stafford Avenue in the um, city of Fresno. Um, but I'm calling um, on behalf of our state organization, which it includes 49 different chapters throughout the state in order to um, urge the county supervisors to use their existing authority um, to support an eviction moratorium for residents in Tulare County. Reason being, um, we've been seeing calls not only within our membership, but also in the broader community of, of residents who expressed um, concern, again, over many of the aforementioned um, points that have been raised um, in the previous uh, supervisor meetings, but also this morning as well, too. So we, again, um, we also would like to urge um, the county supervisors to act in good faith um, to bring um, the discussion of an, an eviction moratorium to the public forum. We understand that this is um, an issue that was raised again in previous meetings and urge the county supervisors to hold either a virtual town hall or some sort of public forum, again, to bring this conversation um, to the public to allow for more um, uh, accessible participation in this very important um, statewide debate. Um, again, also I just want to conclude with thanking the supervisors for their work um, currently to stem um, community spread, but um, as we've been seeing again with the uh, hard data um, and even um, HSSA's presentation, we, we know that the worst is yet to come. And so again, we want to be proactive um, rather than reactive and again, protect Tulare County's um, residents and businesses in a smart, um, delicate and um, uh, way with integrity. So thank you all. Thank you for your comment. Next public comment, Hillary. Good morning. Thank you for holding. You are now connected to the board meeting. Please state your name and address for the record. Your three minutes will begin now. Good, mor good morning. My name is Elena Saldivar. I'm a resident of Pixley. I live at 1432 East Holsty Avenue in Pixley. And um, I wanted to voice a couple of concerns that I'm having. Um, I'm also part of Pixley Town Council and um, We've been uh, contacted by different people, and um, one of the concerns is they're wondering if there is an availability of gloves and masks, and um, for seniors and children, they they have to go out as much as they try not to, and so there's no availability of them at the stores. As we all know, the shelves are empty most of the time of 
many things. And also, I had a concern about the homeless, um, if uh, there's any accommodations being made, because we have several here in our community, and it would be good if they had a place to stay where they wouldn't be up and around all the time at different places uh, because of the concern of the coronavirus. Um, if there's anything available, we'd appreciate to know. I have actually checked with some of the places here that have apartments for rent, and I still haven't got an answer, but one place that has one apartment. And um, also, I'm sorry, I'm going really fast because I'm trying to make the time. Um, the closure of CSET has made it real difficult for uh, our members, and I understand the early mart is also closed, and um, they use, you know, we frequent it a lot because I, I even do um, for co help with correspondence, some of the members do, for employment, for vaccine and energy assistance, and it being closed is a, a real hardship because a lot of people do not have the internet, they can't afford it or whatever, and plus um, they get assistance from the people that work there on doing different kinds of things that they need done as far as um, living their everyday life. and. So um, also um, they have uh, been known to have a, a problem with uh, properly working phones, Internet, and vaccine. I don't know if that's something that you would see about uh, if you could address because uh, quite often either, well, because I've gone to the Early Mart one and the Pixley one, and they both have difficulties with their phone systems, Internet, and stuff like that as long as I've known. And so um, pretty much that would be about it. And I do appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity to bring these concerns to your attention. And I know that you'll do the best you can to help us. And I do appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elaine, for your comment. Next public comment, Hillary. Excuse me? Oh, I, I just said thank you, uh, Elena. We're uh, moving on to our next public comment. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Good morning, thank you for holding. You are now connected to the board meeting. Please state your name and address for the record. Your three minutes will begin now. Good morning, my name is Ambar, A-M-B-A-R, last name Rodriguez, calling from north side of Isalia, 1409 North Divisadero Street. My neighbors are tenants and predominantly speak Spanish. So as I attempt to help them with this whole COVID thing, they have no clue what's going on. And most of the literature put out by the county is attempted to be Spanish, but it's not even properly done in Spanish. You just put some random Spanish words and pass it off as Spanish, which is extremely insulting as if there is no effort about people who speak Spanish. And I know that's not true. Is this thing even being produced in Spanish, this Board of Supervisors meeting? I mean, you guys do tend to worry about the Spanish speakers, right? Anyways, point is, I urge you to use your authority to protect people in our county and pass an eviction moratorium like Madera did, Delano did, and even Fresno County. Yeah, the state did pass one, but that's not enough. You need to help with eviction freezes unless you just don't like your people in your county and you don't even like the people who are most vulnerable, then that's all you have to say. But I stress to please do something about it rather than sitting around being passive. It's not fair for the people who have lost their jobs. They didn't ask for it. So putting a freeze on rent and passing an eviction moratorium, which it would be more comprehensive specifically to Tulare County, rather than keep pushing it back to, oh, well, the state has one, the state has one, cool. But that's not enough. Once again, please stop being passive and do something about it and get this done now. Thank you, I'm done. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Madam Clerk, are there any additional public comments? Yes, there are three more calls. Okay, go ahead. Please do 
something about it? Good morning. Thank you for holding. You are now connected to the board meeting. Please state your name and address for the record. Your three minutes will begin now. Good morning, members of the board and public. My name is Reina Castellanos. I live at 806 East Cypress Avenue, Visalia, California. Uh, local resident, local small business owner. And um, although I know that there have been efforts at state level to try to uh, push information or disseminate it um, regarding a moratorium. I do feel, and I, I've raised this issue several times, I've submitted letters, comment letters, um, stating the need for a local moratorium and enforcement just to make sure that our community um, understands that they, you know, it is important for us as a county to make sure that we don't have um, a larger population of homeless uh, in our community. We understand the type of community we live in. We, we have a very large farm worker, ag community, a lot of dairy workers, and they are literally one paycheck away from homelessness. If we are making a great effort to ensure that we are protecting our current homeless, we do not want to get ourselves into a position to where we now have a larger population. So, um, pushing a moratorium on a local level and enforcing it would be very important for our local community. And speaking of our uh, immigrant community, um, I do feel that um, very proud of the, the city of Fresno for taking an initiative and working with local um, nonprofits to, um, to make sure that there is a fund um, created to help our immigrant community who will not be receiving any type of government stimulus. They are not going to be able to go on unemployment and they are not going to be able to get any type of tax return. So uh, we've got a, a large population that is in a very critical situation where uh, just postponing rent is not going to help because at month two or month three, they would have to pay uh, two, three months of rent. And uh, if it's hard enough to get by during one month period. Now imagine where we're gonna have our community having to come up with two, three months of rent um, when they don't even have the money or access to the money. Um, they've also have had to incur larger expenses like maybe daycare, maybe a, a larger um, increase in the amount of food that they have to provide for their families. So, um, Please take that into consideration. Um, I have also advocated about the need um, for more Spanish um, uh, messaging. Uh, we would love to see a town hall in Spanish, not with subtitles, but actual Spanish language. Um, I think that um, more effort needs to be made to make sure that the, the Spanish speakers who cannot read Spanish can also understand. Mm, that would be it. Thank you for your comments. Good morning. Thank you for holding. You are now connected to the board meeting. Please state your name and address for the record. Your three minutes will begin now. My name is Myra Becerra 
and my address is 15966 Avenue 327. I am calling to urge the board to pass a local moratorium on rent. Our homeless problem is an issue in Visalia and in other counties, and I feel that if we take precaution and make sure that we get this addressed before it becomes a problem, there is there's a higher possibility for us to get something done. I feel that the board needs to be proactive instead of reactive. We need to make sure that we are able to get renters help now and let them know that you know their homes and their stability will be safe since a lot of people are being affected by not having jobs through COVID-19. And I really urge the board to take a step now. And as some of the previous callers have stated, I would like to see more Spanish translation not just on the medical side, but on our whole county side. There's a lot of um, residents that only speak Spanish that need to get this information, as well as other languages. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Okay, our next caller has a regular pu public comment, and then they have a comment for item number four. Okay. Good morning. Thank you for holding. You are now connected to the board meeting. Please state your name and address for the record. Your three minutes will begin now. Good morning. Blanca Escobedo with Leadership Council. Address is 119 Linda Vista Drive in Lindsay. Um, I'm calling today in support of an adoption uh, of an eviction moratorium due to the threat of COVID-19. Um, we all know since then the governor has issued an executive order that allows the residents an additional 60 days to respond to the eviction if they have met all the requirements in the order. Also yesterday, the California Judicial Council suspended evictions for the time being. However, these two orders do not go far enough. They only delay evictions until after the state of emergency is over um, and 90 days after the state of emergency, but it's not banning evictions. It's just delaying evictions. Um, we have seen a lot of deaths in the country already and so many people who are ill a lot of people are also going to be economically impacted by this pandemic. No one is going to come out unscathed. The most vulnerable groups, low income tenants, undocumented populations uh, are, are going to feel the impacts first and are going to feel it more. The county has the ability to protect vulnerable groups so that they are not completely devastated and left without a home. If a tenant also 
if a tenant has an eviction on their record, it makes it so much harder and nearly impossible to rent another place. If they become homeless, it also increases the risk of them getting the virus and transmitting it. The board does have the authority to place stronger protections for tenants. If nothing is done at the local level, we can see a wave of evictions after the governor's order and the judicial court's order expires and the courts start processing evictions again. You cannot punish those who cannot pay their rent for no fault of their own if they're not working right now and cannot find work um, because we're supposed to be staying at home in order to flatten the curve. We need a moratorium that allows landlords and tenants to work together on payment, payment plans that also notifies landlords of the requirements and provides a defense to eviction. Uh, we also need to give tenants flexibility to stay at home until we're out of the wood, until we're out of the woods. Um, also wanna call the board to do a risk assessment for those whose housing is at risk due to COVID. Um, we need all the data and facts and you need to listen to the people who are calling in, look into this matter. Um, and also I support the idea of having a public community discussion, whether it be a virtual town hall um, we're also asking the county to adopt an eviction. Oh, sorry. We're also asking the county to make sure that as the stimulus relief comes down, that the county prioritizes some kind of rental assistance program to help tenants with financial relief so that they're able to pay for all their basic needs. Um, so please put this item on the next agenda, have a community discussion, and be transparent, forward thinking, and meet the moment. Um, I now want to comment on item four. We'll, we'll take up your public comment on item four when we get to that. You want okay. to call back? Um, it, I mean, do we have additional public comment? There's it, one additional comment. If, if, um, Blanca, if it's possible, would you please uh, call back in or do you want to make your public comment right now on item four? I can call back. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Thank you for holding. You are now connected to the board meeting. Please state your name and address for the record. Your three minutes will begin now. Hello. Hello. My name is Andrea Kelly and I reside in Tulare, California. Okay, you can continue with your, your public comment. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't know if I went through. Oh, um, you're good. So, okay. Um, hello, my name is Andrea Kelly. I reside in Tulare, California. I am um, calling on behalf of Food Link for Tulare County. I'm the community engagement coordinator there. Um, I'm calling in support of the eviction um, moratorium, um, and I'm urging our county leaders in order to um, support this moratorium. Um, currently, during this COVID crisis, we have seen our numbers triple at our food distribution, um, having our um, citizens um, really desperate um, in seeking food. We can only imagine um, the other basic needs that they're seeking during this time. And knowing um, that shelter is a basic need and um, very important in the prevention and the spread of COVID, we wanna make sure that everyone is deemed safe. We wanna make sure everybody has um, shelter and that they're not spreading COVID by being out in the streets, like with their families. Um, so we're really urging that our county leaders um, take a stand um, and make sure that they are protecting our citizens and our most vulnerable populations. Thank you for your comments. Thank you.
Good morning. Thank you for holding. You are now connected to the board meeting. Please state your name and address for the record. Your three minutes will begin now. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, go ahead. Your, your public comment time period has begun. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks. For, good morning. My name is Sarah Marquez. I'm, um, I live in Supervisor Cross, Crocker's district. And um, I'm in particularly concerned about um, housing and rent um, during this uh, crisis. Um, I'm at high risk for contracting COVID. Um, so shelter in place is really important. Pardon me, I apologize. Um, it, it is a very scary and emotional time. So um, I am very concerned um, about um, the Board of Supervisors um, passing the buck on dealing with rent over to the state. The state's moratorium is um, confusing and it's, there's not enough information um, for renters to be able to take action. And it's a very short turnaround time when folks are already living month to month. Um, I would like the Board of Supervisors to do a really good risk assessment of what um, what this, what potential risk people have here in the community for potentially losing their housing, so that way the Board of Supervisors can come up with a plan to potentially deal with an additional homeless crisis. We already have one that's, that's difficult, and this could be uh, a potential domino effect later on, and I'm super, super concerned. I'm super concerned with people losing their housing, um, uh, and then either sheltering with other family members and exposing other fa family members um, living in high <laughs> mm, <laughs> uh, pardon me <clears throat> and or not having shelter period um, so I would like an assessment um, a stronger more uh, a moratorium specifically for Tulare County um, as our needs are assessed because I think that's important. Tulare County has very specific needs and those needs to be addressed. Um, uh, and then additionally, um, if y'all could hold a, a town hall so we can hear um, from other uh, county level like experts exactly what this like network of support to keep people in their home and keep people healthy looks like. Um, thank you very much for your time. You have a good day. Thank you. Are there any additional public comments? There are no additional public comments. Okay. Are there any uh, additional public comments from members of the audience? Okay. Seeing none, I will close the public comment period and bring it back to the board. Uh, I know Supervisor Shucklian uh, had a quick comment. Uh, first of all, I just move. Oh, thank you. Um, I just want to mention uh, we heard a lot about um, getting our information out in Spanish. And last week, I, I emailed Tim and, and his folks there, and um, they have started to do the daily video update that we usually see Tammy do. They are doing that now in Spanish, so I want I thank you for that. I forgot to mention that earlier, Tim. Um, and then also, I just want to encourage the folks you know, that have called in about the evictions that um, there, there are a lot of rental assistance. I'm hoping that people are looking into uh, some rental assistance programs and, and whatnot that are out there also. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will now uh, take up our consent calendar, uh, items uh, 4 through 15. Item 4 will be removed for uh, public comment. Are there any additional... She is not called back yet. Well, well, we'll remove the item and take it up separately, and hopefully she's listening and can call back uh, right now. Um, are there any additional items that uh, need to be removed for public comment? So that was the, the item. Okay, so item four will be removed uh, for separate comment from the consent calendar. Are there any additional items to be removed or, or corrected by members of the board or members of the public? Move approval if not. Okay, a move approval of the balance? Yes. Okay. Uh, we have a motion by Supervisor Shuckley and a second by Supervisor Townsend. Please vote. Motion passes 5-0 unanimously. We will take up now item four. We have a comment from Supervisor Valero. 
Yes, um, so I just wanted to uh, make clear and put into record, because I know that there may be some concerns out there with regards to our industrial hemp processing requirement. But do note that there are structures already in place that will help uh, remedy the situation. So I just wanted to kind of read into the record so people are aware that outdoor, all outdoor processing of industrial hemp must be 1,000 feet away from urban development as defined by any city, urban development boundary, park, church, or school. Additionally, all industrial hemp processing requires a 200-foot setback from any residence not owned by the processor. Indoor, all indoor processing of industrial hemp must be 1,000 feet away from any city, urban development boundary, park, church, or school if in an agricultural zone. In manufacturing zones, there is no setback requirement from urban development. Nevertheless, in manufacturing zones, it requires a 200-foot setback from any residential zones. Special use permits, all industrial hemp processing uh, requires an approved special use permit. The Planning Commission approves, conditionally approves, or denies special use permits after holding, holding a public hearing during which the public has the opportunity to make comments. Property owners within 300 feet receive an advance notice of the proposal and the date time of the public hearing, so they have the opportunity to share comments in advance of the Planning Commission's decision. And that is what I wanted to include in the record. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Uh, thank you. We do have additional public comment that is on the line at this time. Hillary? Good morning. Thank you for holding. You are now connected to the board meeting. Please state your name and address for the record. Your three minutes will begin now. Uh, Blanca Escobedo, 119 Linda Vista Drive in Lindsay. Um, the audio is a little bit delayed online, so I was just hearing uh, Supervisor Valero talking about um, how there will be an opportunity for communities or um, for people to give um, a comment when if there's ever a permit for this type of facility. But I also wanted to call in to express concerns um, on the cultivation requirements and processing requirements on page five of the ordinance. Um, specifically, um, point B, item three, where there's a minimum, um, we are calling for a minimum 1,000 foot setback from any residence not owned by a grower. It's per, uh, presently 200 feet. Um, and for the processing requirements, item B, point two, um, we're also ca uh, calling for a minimum 1,000 foot setback for many residents in agricultural zoning and M1 and M2. The reason for this is because a lot of uh, unincorporated communities or already disadvantaged communities are placed near these types of zoning and complain about um, impacts um, from invasive facilities ex that are already existing. Um, and we want to make sure that the county ag commissioner and other staff are taking the community's concerns um, if and when there is a uh, applicant um, wanting to apply or issue a permit. Um, if and when this happens, uh, the applicant and the county or commissioner in the county should consult with communities to reach a community benefits agreement if they are going to be exposed to impacts from this industry. Invasive industries um, are always on the backs of these communities and we're already, we have been hearing um, impacts from pesticide drift, pesticide exposure, air quality impacts. Um, not, nonetheless, this type of industry can also bring, <clears throat> excuse me, more truck traffic, noxious odors, and public safety concerns. So I just wanted to read those concerns, um, and hopefully, um, as this progresses, we really do bring communities to the table to make sure that their concerns are addressed. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you for your public comment. Are there any additional public comments, Madam Clerk? Okay. Seeing no public comments, no additional public comments, we will bring it back to the board for discussion and or action. Supervisor Crocker. Mr. Chair, I'd move to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Supervisor Crocker, second by Supervisor Shuckley, and please vote.
motion passes 5-0 unanimous. Uh, thank you very much for uh, that motion and item. We will now take up our untimed portion of our meeting uh, today. Um, we'll take up item 16, which is a request from the clerk of the board to amend resolution number 2020-0057 regarding evening meetings in 2020. <coughs> Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, um, on behalf of our chief clerk, uh, she's requesting that we amend the resolution uh, 2020-0057 um, to change, to delete the April 21st evening meeting and related three o'clock closed session and schedule the regular meeting on April 21st, 2020 at 9 a.m. here in these chambers. All right, uh, Chair will entertain a motion on this item. Uh, any public comment or uh, comment in, within the chambers? Okay, seeing none, we have a motion by Supervisor Valero. Second. Second by Supervisor Townsend. Please vote. Well, I would I would vote for uh, Supervisor Shucklin, but she is not here, and so uh, since she has stepped off the dais, she will abstain from this vote, and the motion. Uh, does pass uh, four zero with one abstention from Supervisor Shucklin, who has stepped off the dais. We will now take up uh, item 17, which is a request from the County Administrative Office to receive the mid year budget report for fiscal year 2019 2020. I will turn it over to you, Mr. CAO. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. It's my pleasure to bring to you the 2019-20 uh, fiscal year mid-year budget report today. Uh, just a quick framework of what we're gonna be discussing today is we'll talk a little bit about our financial strengths and challenges, um, some of the state uh, budget um, highlights, um, dive into a local perspective in terms of our assessed evaluation, sales and use tax, property, uh, Prop 172 tax, and we'll um, talk about department requests and also ask for your approval for the fiscal year 2021 budget schedule. So going on to our county financial strengths, um, we continue to um, see economic growth and development, although that's suddenly changed yeah. um, recently. Um, our budget is still within a, uh, in alignment with our fiscal sustainability. Uh, our growth of reserves and trust fund uh, management um, has, is one of our strengths, is that we uh, continue during the good times to build reserves and other um, tr uh, sub funds, and we manage, have managed those uh, fairly um, well um, to help us uh, weather um, any downturns. The county has also continued to, um, through the financial policies and the direction of this board, to adopt uh, and to have effective debt management. So we have um, very little debt, um, mo mostly um, aside from our pension obligation bonds. The only other debt we really um, have um, is our uh, Millennium Fund bonds, variable rate bonds, and a very small debt uh, left on um, a... Um, energy efficiency project. Um, we continue to um, improve our capital uh, projects um, and maintenance and, con and ex uh, construction expansion. And the departments continue to perform at levels consistent with the county's adopted business plan. So there's a few areas of the January's governor's budget that was proposed. Um, the total budget is $222.2 billion. Um, I won't go through all of the numbers because um, those are likely to change now. Um, but there are still some special areas of interest uh, that the state is, um, we're, we are expecting the state to continue to focus on, and that is including uh, looking at their reserves and reducing liabilities, housing affordability, homelessness, uh, emergency response, um, continued investment in K-12 education, expanding access to higher education, climate protection, criminal justice um, changes, and um, jobs and protecting the environment. Um, most recently, as of, I, I'm not sure, I believe it was April 5th or 6th, um, 
Assembly member Phil Ting, which is the, he's the chair of the Assembly Budget Committee, uh, released a letter that sort of um, outlines the Assembly's plan for the state's budget through this COVID-19 crisis. And I just wanted to share that with the board and the public so that, because um, at the time of this uh, writing of this uh, presentation, um, things were a little different. Um, so one is, um, the governor's May revise, which comes out typically in mid-May, um, is expected to be a workload budget. Um, I'm not quite sure what that word means, other than um, we think that it will continue to reflect current <coughs> service levels for 1920, so essentially um, what I might call as a status quo uh, budget for the state, if, I, if I'm interpreting that language um, correctly. Um, he also has outlined that when the legislature resumes at work, it will not consider any new spending priorities, stakeholder ideas, with the exception of, or stakeholder ideas, with the exception of COVID-19 related costs, wildfire prevention, or homelessness. Um, and in fact, um, it also may be necessary to revisit and reduce existing state programs depending on the state's fiscal condition. Um, given that there is a three-month delay uh, for personal income taxes, uh, Chair Ting points out that the state will not have a complete picture of available revenues really until August. And so therefore, he expects um, really um, budget deliberations to really begin in earnest in August. So um, I bring that up just to sort of highlight that uh, there will be some continuing um, uncertainty in the state's budget as we weather through this COVID-19 um, uh, response and, and we are able to better understand what that really means um, to the state's economy as well as the local and federal economy. The governor also stated on April 4th in his um, noon press conference um, that all January budget proposals are being reviewed and, quote, recalibrated in relationship to the budgetary crisis that is starting to manifest. Despite the ac across-the-board reconsideration, the governor made clear he does not plan to walk away from reforms, implying that some reforms could proceed without budgetary impacts. I highlight that just because the governor himself is starting to use language such as uh, budgetary crisis. Um, he's also, they're also looking at potentially some reductions um, in the state budget. Uh, so again, it's un, we, we don't know how that's going to look. We don't know how that's all going to shake out, um, but we will continue to monitor that and, and update this board as, um, as appropriate. Switching now from the state to the local perspective, um, we continue to enjoy um, fairly good uh, local assessed evaluation um, increases. As you see there, our three-year average is at 4.77, um, a 15-year average of 4.79. So uh, good job, Mr. Assessor, that's out in the um, audience today. Didn't um, even get a smile, Mr. CAO. He's not, maybe he's sleeping. Um, so again, I think that reflects that we are a growing county. Um, assessed valuation has, it continues to grow, which is good for in terms of property tax uh, valuation. Um, again, this is our sales and use tax allocation. This is really just a 10-year picture of our actual revenues compared to in the last column there, the darker shaded blue is what we budgeted this year. Um, so we did conservatively budget revenues, um, and, um, and you can see where we actually came in um, for 2019 and prior. Um, again, not sure exactly what this new uncharted territory is going to bring to us, um, but um, we will continue to keep the board updated as, 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 poss as much as possible. Uh, same thing on our Proposition 172 public safety sales tax. Again, um, we um, have budgeted a little bit lower than our normal um, collected revenues. And you can see there that that has steadily climbed 
um, over, the, over the past few years, a pretty large bump uh, last year. And um, again, uh, we do expect that if there are uh, revenue um, declines, it's most likely going to be in sales tax, TOT, um, still not clear what happens with property tax, although the tax collector did inform me this morning that we are on track for collecting property taxes at historical averages. So um, so at least that sounds good on the property tax. Historical averages plus $25, right? Yeah, yeah maybe. So, so the good news on the property tax front, at least, um, it looks like that our collections, we'll know more next week as the uh, final deadline is Friday, April 10th, on, on what that looks like. Um, in terms of our departments, um, departments are continue to be on track. Um, they continue to be at, at or below allocated targets. Um, our general re fund revenues um, are 35% collected. Um, that's about 1% lower than last year. And our expenditures are at 51% expensed, which is about 2% prior than last year. And as you can, um, that, and that's kind of normal uh, for this time of year. There's not really anything super abnormal. We'll look at those a little bit more in detail as we get on uh, with the report. Um, before we get into those individual discussions, there is sort of a five-year summary of our uh, general fund budget and with the number of filled and allocated positions and our, um, and our percent of uh, filled positions. Mr. Chair, before you, Mr. Chair, I am the chair. Man, I got um, promoted today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mr. To CAO, <laughs> Mr. CAO, thank you for um, uh, the presentation. Just real quick while I had uh, this slide up, I think it's important for departments that are following online or um, members of the audience seeing this. You know, we have maintained 86, 86, 86, 86. Now we're at 85 percent of filled positions. It, it appears to me that you know over time we are growing as a county uh, very responsibly, but our number of uh, filled positions has remained the same, which indicates to me we have a lot of filled, or I'm sorry, a lot of positions on the books that may not be necessary. Are, is there going to be an effort underway, especially given the uncertainties of what is coming in the future, to uh, right size departments to the actual number of positions that are needed to uh, provide the important services that our departments provide? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think departments have um, vacancy rates and vacant positions for a number of reasons. Um, certainly, we uh, through the budget development process this year, we can work with each department to determine and evaluate um, why that is and what that looks like and um, encourage them to reduce those numbers if, if we find necessary. Um, but your point is well taken. I appreciate that, that feedback and we'll take that to the departments and as we work on budget development, we'll look at those, um, those vacant positions and, and what we can maybe do to help reduce that gap. Okay, thank you. Um, so in our mid-year, going on to our general revenues, as you can see here with our five-year picture, uh, there's really nothing um, uncommon or unusual um, out of the ordinary. We, we are on track uh, to, to look at our, our general O31 revenues um, and, and same for our, the remainder of our general fund revenues. We continue to track about the same um, uh, place we are at every mid-year report uh, between recognized and uncollected. Um, dollars and those, um, so we we're, we're feel confident that um, absent some major um, issue with the state budget where they may um, slow payments, um, they may have a cash flow issue, uh, or um, chop uh, programs um, sort of, quote, mid-year or at the beginning of the year, um, I don't expect that to really change much. Uh, again, our, our general fund uh, expenditures, moving on to the expenditure side, um, again, at a five-year picture, we're sort of tracking about where we are um, each year at this time um, between obligated and unobligated expenses. So 
Uh, again, another um, reason that we believe we will finish um, on target, um, again, absent something major intervening uh, due to this COVID um, crisis. Um, we do have some departmental requests to add a few positions and to delete a few positions. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole list. Um, the um, majority of these have been all discussed with our, the office, and the departments have made um, good uh, business case reasons for needing them. Um, the district attorney has a handful of positions for his cornerstone or his Porterville office that's going to be uh, soon moving to the cornerstone building. Um, there is of note uh, four positions in here, three fire apparatus engineers and a fire captain. Um, that will, our, our staffing that is going to go to support Fire Station 1 as it starts to open later this spring. Um, we also have um, salary request adjustment requests. Essentially, um, there's a whole lot of things on this page, but essentially this is the 2% equity increase for unrepresented attorneys that um, we did in mid-year so that we could coincide that equity increase on July 5th to commensurate with the effective date of all the other cost of living adjustments that occur with the county through um, either what's been passed by this board or through negotiated MOUs and a, a couple positions where we had to do some, some cleanup um, for parity. Uh, mid, uh, major capital assets, um, there's a number of capital assets uh, here for uh, a burnisher for custodial, um, an AC machine for fleet, um, some cars and battery packups, a lot of things, x-ray machine, pressure washers, generators. Uh, probation has some, um, is also purchasing a duress system and full metal detectors that will be used at their new Kmart, or I don't know what, if we've named that building yet, but formerly known as Kmart building um, that for security and uh, entering that building. Um, and then the road fund is making um, some requests um, for uh, pickups and uh, message boards uh, for their work out on the roads. <laughs> message, <laughs> message sign boards. Um, we do have a few uh, budget uh, adjustment requests, um, mostly to um, help cover operating expenses for our airport. Uh, we still uh, operate uh, Sequoia Field at a, at a deficit. Um, and then, again, um, some requests for the um, capital assets to adjust their budget in order to make those purchases. Uh, also transferring uh, funds to capital projects for capital project needs that have been occurring at the Visalia Courthouse. Uh, and um, also um, transferring funds for IT to, to cover costs with around 26 projects that they've been working on. Um, we also have um, some unanticipated revenue from the Medi-Cal outreach program for our library. Um, we're also um, asking to transfer funds to capital projects to cover costs for the Cornerstone building um, and also continue funding, uh, transferring funds to close the gap on our groundwater sustainability, sustainability agency membership fees. Um, we also are asking to transfer funds to cover capital projects, expense, and capital asset purchases in probation. Um, and then, of course, um, the uh, roads uh, board adjustment for their capital assets. And then uh, um, also to cover administrative support for water operations and consolidation for Seville Water. So that's the good news. The, there are some financial challenges aside from the COVID-19 pandemic that uh, I've probably um, continued beating this drum and uh, will continue to do so. Um, you know, we are um, entering an, an, um, a time of uncertainty, not sure what that looks like, um, but it's also a time where we're increasing operational and structural costs fairly, um, uh, fairly high, uh, quite a bit. There's also increasing legislative and regulatory requirements relating to employee compensation that drives a lot of our costs. 
uh, rising employer retirement contribution, which is um, potentially could get worse with the downturn in the market, uh, along with our pension obligation bond payments, uh, detention facility operational costs, um, mostly, although not exclusively, in the area of gel medical. Uh, that is continues to be uh, uh, an increasing cost to the general fund. Um, our fire department, uh, organizational and capital asset planning, um, our zones of benefit, water and wastewater system, our internal service funds expenses, outpacing rate increases, our groundwater sustainability agency fees and other regulatory compliance, and of course, uh, any type of economic recession and impact of the COVID-19 pandemic can present challenges to our budget. I did want to bring to the board's attention some specific um, structural costs that are increasing to our board or to our budget, um, primarily because uh, we have been in, the board, and along with our departments, have been engaged in a number of projects over the last couple of years. Um, things like um, the formerly known as Kmart building, the Cornerstone building. Um, our new uh, Motorola dispatch center, uh, dispatch um, software, and a lot of those costs are now are now going to be realized in the fiscal year 2021 budget, and those costs are um, significant. Um, we're estimating around six million dollars just for cost of living, step merit, and benefit increases another $1.1 million in the rental costs associated with the Kmart uh, lease, um, a, almost a $700,000 increase in rental uh, costs associated with the uh, Cornerstone building for the DA and the public defender. Um, and this, does, this figure does not include any staffing that may have to come along with, with, with the um, the portable courthouse opening new courtrooms and expanding business in the South County. And then an, um, a $2.6 million increase in gel medical costs. And again, these continue to grow every single year. And, and um, these, this is uh, above and beyond our current $3.9 million general fund uh, contribution. And then of course, a couple, uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars for our dispatch center and then um, we're expecting about a four and a half to $5 million increase in general fund support for the fire department. Um, and this is primarily due to increase in salaries, benefits, and costs associated with Fire Station One. Um, those things alone add up to a lot. Um, and um, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15 million dollars and I'm guessing that we'll be able to, inc we'll have increased revenues around eight to 10. Um, so we are gonna have to look at um, maintaining and keeping some of our, our cost um, on target and looking at um, ensuring that as we go through budget development and budget planning, that we are um, really not growing um, much and that we're keeping the status quo. I know that's difficult for departments sometimes uh, because we also have to balance the demand for increasing uh, services. Um, but um, right now with the, just the general growth that's occurred in the county along with the potential downturn in revenue that, that we're watching closely, um, th that is going to put pressure on our budget. We do not know what that looks like yet, um, and there are a lot of things that we can do uh, before we get there, um, but that I, did, I don't want to leave the board with an idea that um, it's going to be um, as easy as it has been in past years. Um, the final challenge I just wanted to point out to the board um, is um, the, um, the budget adjustment that we're asking for to cover our groundwater management agency membership fees. Um, in, um, in, fiscal, in the previous fiscal year, we were paying about 715,000. This year we budgeted for 904, and the actual fees are 1.4. So it's a $558,000 increase. I do know that some of the GSAs are 
looking at Prop 218 processes to help recoup some of those. Um, but I did want to bring this to the board's attention because of the large variance. Um, it is $558,000 that we're having to make up that was unexpected. And there's also the CV SALTS program that's likely to materialize next year, which is going to require another investment um, probably from us. And so there's more to come on that, but just wanted to bring that to the board's attention. Um, and finally, um, we are, um, our budget schedule for this year is going to be um, notice the final budget hearing posted on August 26th uh, with final budget materials to the board and the public on the 28th. Um, the recommended budget hearing is um, set to be um, September 15th. Um, with the final budget hearing, um, which may proceed to October 2nd, also on September 15th. Um, we are expecting to get personnel resolutions with all adopted personnel actions finalized by September 18th, and an adopted budget book to the Board of Supervisors and public by November 20th. And um, with that, with the auditor um, submitting our adopted budget book to the state um, on December 1st, which is... Um, within the timeline schedule uh, by the board. And finally, as we go into budget development with the, with the departments, um, I, um, I want to recognize that with the COVID-19 response and duration, that may create some uh, challenges for our departments in the budget arena. And my office um, stands ready to be flexible and to be of assistance to departments as much as possible to help us meet our targets and meet our timelines. Um, we will proceed with a, a budget protocol plan that we have used um, in previous years, which is we will use historically conservative and reasonable revenue estimates to ensure a balanced budget. Uh, proceeds from sales of real property uh, will be designated for future capital needs. Um, one-time funds used for one-time purposes uh, that's going to be um, more important um, than ever, this budget development um, cycle. Um, we also want to emphasize that county agencies and departments um, should seek grants and other funding opportunities and revenue sources to maximize subvention uh, prior to usage of general fund support and also minimize commitments requiring reoccurring general fund support. Um, and then finally, any structural increases or substantial one-time funding to agency or department budgets require an analysis of new or expanded sources of revenue and operational efficiencies to ensure budget sustainability. And again, um, we, we just want to make sure as we, as we enter into times of uncertainty that we continue to minimize our growth and that we are um, able to contain, uh, to continue to have and enjoy a balanced budget. Um, and continue to provide the services that we need to provide. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank the board for their support, um, all of the staff in the county administrative office, the clerk of the board, HR, auditor, controller, tax collector, the assessor, clerk, recorder, county council, and all the county agencies and departments who, who participate in providing information and data for this presentation. And um, with that, I will answer any questions or comments. All right, Supervisor Crocker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple things. One, I wanted to, um, and I know you stated this already, but just recognize um, I think it's very positive that we have conservative revenue projections um, based on um, what's going on right now. I think that that will um, be very helpful where we're not budgeting for um, large increases in sales tax and other uh, revenue. Is that should help us with um, easing the pain. Um, also, I wanted to highlight that um, in addition, um, for Fire Station 1 in particular, one of the, or part of the staffing, the cost increase is that we're going to 2-0 staffing for uh, Fire Station 1, or that will be a 2-0 staffing, correct? That's my understanding. Yeah, so th I mean, that's, that's a positive thing in and of itself, recognizing that we don't have, not all fire stations have that that level of staffing, so um, that's something very positive um, that we'll be getting not only a new station, but but getting that uh, 2 -0 staffing. A um, couple of, of questions, um, or 
requests. One on the, I appreciate bringing up the uh, sustainable groundwater management and some of the GSA rising costs. And I'd like to um, bring to attention to um, my board colleagues as well as staff on the East Cahuilla uh, Groundwater Sustainability Agency. East Cahuilla has taken a different approach than most uh, GSAs where they are, um, they are going through the process, we are going through a process of doing a 218. However, that 218 will be limited um, to only certain types of costs. There will still be costs associated to the individual members that are participating in the agency. So there will still be larger costs that the county um, would um, be on the hook for, for the wide areas that are included in, in the East Cahuilla. Most of the other GSAs, I believe, have um, their own mechanisms to do uh, GSA-wide uh, 218s. Um, the other members are uh, water agencies, so they have ability to already assess, and they're going through their own individual assessments um, to recoup those costs uh, from their members. However, we don't necessarily have that ability. And so I would recommend that we begin the process to create a new um, district or some, whatever that process looks like, I don't know specifically, but to recoup those costs. I think that the individual farmers in the East Cahuilla would, um, they recognize and understand um, that they've got to foot their uh, share of the costs as well. And, um, and I think that's something that's worthwhile to pursue to uh, overcome those, that half million plus dollars that, and possibly even more. I mean, the, the costs of, of groundwater sustainability agencies are only increasing. And so I, I, don't, I think that's worthwhile. I know, I recognize that that's something that would take time to be able to create a specific uh, fee district to recoup costs just for this GSA. Um, but because of the way that the, the leadership has gone about it, that I think that's necessary for this particular GSA that won't necessarily be needed for some of the others because they're, they're doing it GSA-wide. Um, so that's, that's the comment or request, and I'd be very supportive of going through that to help us recoup some of, the, some of those costs. The other um, question is actually for our tax collector. I know he's in the hallway. And um, it's somewhat unrelated, but it, I think it, it's still kind of related. Um, if you could just provide an update on the property tax situation. And I know that um, as it relates to COVID-19, um, and you know, I know you've already had a press release that went out and you've tried to be very proactive, and so I appreciate that. Um, I'm sure that I'm not the only one that's getting calls and contacts about Kern County and what their grandstanding is doing, if you could just maybe comment on that. I, I don't know if your mic's on. Did you, yeah, did maybe just on the screen, maybe? Switch, switch over to the... Uh, is it, it is on? Okay. Uh, yeah, so I just, first of all, I'd encourage everyone who has the ability to pay to pay their property tax by this Friday. April I did 10th. yesterday. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, and then just also highlight that property tax goes to counties, cities, special districts, um, even hospitals. So it's funding those frontline workers that are so busy and essential right now. So I want to highlight that as well. Uh, state law um, designates April 10th as the due date for property tax. Uh, in consultation with county council, we've reaffirmed that that is the law and we don't have the ability to change the, that due date. Um, so property tax are due on the 10th. Uh, within property tax, California law, there is uh, ability uh, by the tax collector to uh, waive penalties and fees. Now that's a very narrow uh, window of, of what we're able to do. Um, but in terms of COVID-19, uh, we, that, that window is actually opening a little bit. So property tax due on the 10th, but after the 10th on our website, we'll have a form for those who cannot pay uh, to fill out um, to, uh, due to COVID, directly due to COVID-19 reasons, they could ask for a penalty waiver 
um, and then and then make a payment without a, a penalty. So that's that will be going up Friday. Friday evening. So w we can direct individuals to the website at yeah. Friday evening and say there will be a, a place for people to seek that relief. That's right. I, we would appreciate that. I would also, oh, I see I already mentioned it. We're on track so far on, on property taxes collected to date. So. And so just to reaffirm, so what Kern County has done is essentially the same thing that you're doing. They're just stating it in a different way. They don't have any uh, new authority that you don't. They don't have any new authority that yeah. uh, I don't. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Auditor, Treasurer, Tax Collector. Um, are you done, Supervisor Crocker, with your questions? Okay, Supervisor Shuckling. <clears throat> yeah, first of all, I want to thank Jason and all his staff for their hard work on, on putting this together. It's uh, very thorough, a little disheartening and a little scary, but uh, we, we need to be transparent and know what's ahead for us. It's kind of unfortunate that it seems like everything that was um, uh, planned in the past with good intent is kind of co all coming online now, fire station, jail, and it's, it's all hitting us at, at once. Um, but I know we'll, we'll work through it. And I just want to uh, reiterate my agreement with Chairman Vanderpool on uh, taking a look at the vacancies uh, the vacancy rate within the departments and see what we can do about that. That's it. All right, Supervisor Valero. Yes, all right, thank you. Uh, I too wanna echo my colleagues in saying thank you to our CAO and leadership team for putting this together, especially in factoring in uncharted territory as we move forward. And then also to all of the department heads for being understanding during these times as well. I just wanted to bring up um, something that was mentioned by Supervisor Townsend a few uh, meetings ago with regards to our roads. And I know that he had expressed uh, interest in seeing somewhat of an increase. Would that be reflected here or some? Th that, would, that would not be reflected here okay. right now. That would likely be reflected um, either in the budget development process for new budget okay. coming next year or um, through a separate um, um, avenue through the CTIP that they normally do um, each year. But we, we have not lost sight of, of the road issue and the reserves. Um, I've been working with RMA to um, figure out um, what that looks like and when that should come to your board for discussion. So it, it should be coming okay. soon. And then lastly, also just echoing my colleagues in terms of vetted, vetting the positions that um, are sitting there and what can be removed um, in addition to what we're adding to. So thank you. Thank you. All right, Supervisor Townsend. Yeah, and just also wanted to thank you, our CAO and, uh, and all the staff for putting this together and uh, especially appreciate you, Jason, for uh, always reaching out and uh, telling us ahead of time, keeping us very much in, in the loop about the about your thoughts and uh, and I think the uh, fiscal conservatism uh, <laughs> uh, approach that we're taking is it's just very wise and I think it's showing how prudent it is uh, in this given time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, and then I will just uh, conclude uh, comments with just uh, reiterating a lot of what has been said by my colleagues. I think it's uh, uh, been a great job that you've uh, done here, Jason, uh, and your team. And I wanna thank all department heads and county employees for your understanding and adhering to uh, the guidance laid out here. Um, you know, I, I know we are entering and are in very uncertain times and we don't know where this is gonna go, uh, but I do think that uh, our budget protocol plan and what we have done year over year to put us in the financial position that we are in here today is very, very important to be mindful of going forward. Um, I do think that this approach is going to result in Tulare County being in a better position than uh, many of our uh, fellow counties who are a little bit more uh, aggressive in their revenue estimates and uh, are underestimating expenses. While we do have our own set of uncertainties and unknowns uh, that you have listed here um, that we have to prepare for, uh, our approach has uh, historically bode us very well, and I think it's going to help us uh, get through this uh, situation that we are uh, coming up to. So 
Uh, appreciate the comments. You want to add anything again? Just, Mr. Right. Chair, just want to before we before the board took action, just wanted to say one is um, you know again I do appreciate the board's guidance. I also appreciate all the departments and agency heads. Um, we we're we're in this together. Um, if you are having trouble uh, through this crisis uh, getting your budget completed, please engage with my office sooner than than later so we can help you with that. Um, and, and then finally, before the board takes action, I'd just like to re read the requested actions. One is to receive the major budget report for fiscal year 1920. Two, to approve the proposed schedule and adoption of the fiscal year 2021 budget, which incorporates a rollover budget as the operating budget, including capital projects, for the period between July 1st, 2020 and adoption of the fiscal year 2021 budget. Also to adopt the personnel resolution to add, delete, and amend positions and approve and amend the required job specifications, class designations, and salary adjustments proposed in the mid-year report subject to meet and confer. Four, to approve the capital asset purchase list and to five, authorize the auditor controller, treasurer, tax collector with the concurrence of the county administrative officer to process any budget adjustments proposed for in the mid-year budget report. Okay, thank you very much. I, uh, before we take action, want to open it up for public comment. Is there anyone here uh, in the audience wishing to comment on uh, the mid-year budget report? Uh, sure, please do come forward, uh, state your name and address. Good morning, Chairman. Scott Harness, uh, 653 North Hayes, Dinuba. Just out of curiosity, uh, after the uh, presentation by your CAO with everything you've got going on right now, the, the pie only being so big, um, with code enforcement, with HHSA's personnel requests, does that include um, the additional need for manpower to, to uh, attack this um, sidewalk vendor issue that seems to be a consensus of the, the board? there's enough money included for a new badge for Supervisor Shuckland. Well, I would help her with that badge if I could <laughs> get one as well. But uh, clearly, there's, it's been a manpower issue. Uh, sitting on Dinuba's GAC, we've met with Health and Human Services, and uh, it's a lack of manpower. So with those additional personnel um, uh, requests, does that include something specific uh, to tackle the, the sidewalk vendors? So that, that the, the personal requests to add that are before the board today from the health agency does, does not include uh, resor their, uh, resources for that. It's primarily around um, to expand their whole person care waiver and some other um, services that the, that the state is expanding. Um, I do know that the, um, the agency, and I don't know if Tim wants to speak to this, but they, they will be... Um, bringing their normal fee proposal on the 21st that typically they outline sort of what their plan is for environmental health at that time. Um, I, I'm not sure what the resource constraints are for environmental health, um, but um, I, I know Tim and his team are looking at that to try to figure out how we can, how we can manage that. Um, I just know historically from my years of being at the agency, it has really boiled down to um, there is a direct correlation between the amount of fees that people pay and the number of staff you get. Okay. Um, and that's the balance. That's difficult to achieve sometimes. Okay. All right. Well, I just would note that um, uh, District 4, Supervisor Valero has been uh, approached many times. Uh, the, we ha uh, Dinuba's GAC has members, uh, business owners in Dinuba and unincorporated jurisdiction. And... Um, we would like to help with a solution, uh, basically a coalition of other chambers to um, uh, request respectfully uh, more code enforcement there. Um, the, the consensus from uh, small business owners is just to allow uh, equal time, equal focus on the sidewalk vendors as they are the brick and mortars. Uh, that's been the discouraging part is is the focus on brick and mortar and, and driving past some of the others. So on behalf of those business owners, I just wanted to ask that question. Thank you. Thank you. Can I uh, mention something also, Scott? Um, we've talked about this in the past, and the sheriff has also 
uh, working on this because of labor trafficking. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks, are, they're coming, and that's what I see. You see people just standing there with no car or some... I saw a guy the other day didn't even have a chair. So, you know, there's there's more to this than, than that, but I agree with you uh, regarding the enforcement and what needs to happen. Okay. I, and I, I didn't want to put that on, on the sheriff uh, because I don't know his budget specifically. In Dinuba, we were able to use PD, and um, we tackled this with the uh, Obama phone providers setting up across the street from cell phone stores. And so we had the resources in small town Dinuba to be able to, to use PD, but I didn't know if uh, the county could do the same. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Lux, do you have any comments? Um, and thank you, Jason, for echoing a lot of what um, I would say. We don't have any specific requests on code enforcement, um, not code enforcement, environmental um, health inspectors within this budget request. Um, fees do continue to be a a limiting factor for us. So the way that we fund our environmental health program is primarily fee-based. Um, historically over the years, as the cost of our staffing has gone up, retirement contributions, all of those, those labor factors have gone up, we've um, had to backfill some of that with our um, health realignment dollars. The challenge we have with that backfill is um, creating a balance of every time you're using that, it's it's decreasing response elsewhere. With our increased jail medical costs, um, a significant portion of our health realignment dollars are also going toward um, toward addressing um, health care within our, our jails. So um, what we try to do is strike a balance. We, we are vetting with um, the CAO right now about bringing a new fee proposal forward that would change fees somewhat to our restaurants. We hope this will help address it because what we want to start to do is look at where we can add more staff or do some types of, of rotational coverage to provide broader coverage on weekends, evenings, times that we have a lot of those, those types of, of problems or challenges that we're hearing about. But we are very cognizant about bringing fees forward that are then going to turn around and impact our business community. I'll just make a comment. Uh, I, I think that it's, it's a very important point to realize that, yes, environmental health is fee-driven. It's a cost recovery type model. Um, but when businesses that are brick and mortar are paying fees to cover their own inspections, they're also paying fees that should uh, benefit them by uh, helping to reduce those that aren't complying, that aren't playing by the same rules. Um, and, and so uh, it would be, you know, to me, uh, it would seem that it would be logical to reduce uh, the uh, policing of brick and mortar uh, institutions to increase uh, a little bit on the enforcement side or in inspection side of the non-complying vendors because of the impact they are having on general public health and welfare by getting people ill or um, by having uh, more of a, a negative impact because they aren't inspected. So um, I, I just think that we have to you know, maybe uh, rethink how we are approaching uh, the environmental health inspections and code enforcement, utilize uh, the sheriff a little bit more and uh, maybe create an innovative program to help address the human trafficking aspect uh, as well as the um, uh, unlicensed vendor aspects as well. but I think that's an excellent suggestion on, on looking for, as we evolve, clearly we need to evolve with the, the times and where the challenges are. Those are a lot of the discussions we are having in environmental health and we'll continue to have. I really like the suggestion on those types of coalitions or groups that we can come together with and, and try and address this holistically. And Supervisor Valero had a yes. question or comment. I just want to say that I agree wholeheartedly with our chairman. Um, and also just to share, because I know that uh, Mr. Washam, who's outside, I know that he has been working on code enforcement in terms of hours and operations when they're out in the field. And so maybe, again, stressing that to our inspectors to say, look, we're going to divvy up the times, uh, whether it be during the day or in the evening, but also to continue to have that enforcement visible. So thank you. 
All right, thank you. Uh, any additional comments uh, from board members? All right, the chair will entertain a motion at this time. A motion to approve. We have a motion by Supervisor Valero. Second. Second by uh, Supervisor Townsend. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously five to zero. Uh, we will now take up the next item on our agenda, which is item 18. Uh, at this item, board members may make a referral to staff to have a matter of business considered for a future agenda. Uh, I have a request from Supervisor Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And that was just to uh, follow up on the comment that I made during uh, board matters. I would like us to uh, take up the consideration of drafting uh, a resolution of opposition uh, to the court order uh, ordering the release of uh, 50 inmates from Tulare County jails. Uh, if we could uh, pursue that, I would appreciate it. Okay, and that item will be considered. Thank you. Um, any additional items for consideration? Okay, seeing none. Uh, council, do we have need for closed session today? We do, Mr. Chairman. Item B is off calendar. The remainder of the items will be heard in closed session. I do expect one announcement out. Okay, so there will be one announcement. Thank you for attending today's regular session of the Board of Supervisors. We will now adjourn to closed session. Stay healthy. This is Her Sharon Sakon, Deputy County Counsel. Oh, for myself. This is Her Sharon Sakon reporting out for item A. Um, the Board of Supervisors directed legal counsel to defend and tender defense to applicant in the case of the Quia Coalition versus County of Tulare. No. This is her Sharon Sakon, Deputy County Counsel, reporting out for item A. Um, the Board of Supervisors directed legal counsel to defend and tender defense to applicant in the case of the Quia Coalition versus the County of Tulare. Tulare County Superior Court case number VCU 282553. Um, the adverse party is the Quia Coalition and the case involves litigation against the county regarding its approval of special use permit number PSP 19-019 Redwood Ranch. The roll call vote was unanimous with a motion by Supervisor Crocker and a second by Amy Shuklian. And this concludes the report out for today's closed session.